This is Cameron Meyer of the Orlando Weekly and MeyerMovies.com. I'm here at the 2015 Florida Film Festival with the great Bob Balaban. Mr. Balaban, it's, it's, uh, it's great to meet you. Not that great. <laughs> Thank you for speaking with me today. Uh, inside, the audience is watching Gosford Park, and we're outside talking about the film. So I know this is a film that means a great deal to you because you were a co-producer. You essentially came up with the idea for the film, uh, and you also star in it. Can you tell me a little bit about what this film means to you and, and how it got started? I will tell you both. But the reason it really means something to me is I got to work with Robert Altman, who had been a friend of mine for 20 or 30 years, but I'd never really worked with him. I made a little documentary about him. We saw each other socially. I loved his wife and his family. But this meant that I got to spend months of my life just being with Bob all the time. And it was exciting, complicated, artistically amazing, and a chance to do. It's probably one of the highlights of my uh, career around our life. Uh, I really had a great time. The movie started because I was sitting around in my office in New York um, 15 years ago going, hmm, nothing's happening. What can I do to make my life better? I'm an actor. I get jobs acting, and sometimes I produce things. Move, I've produced a couple of movies and plays and some TV things, and I, and I act. But when you act, you wait for the phone to ring, and when you produce, you actually get to maybe make something happen that didn't drop in your lap. You actually have to do something about it. I was trying to think of what I could do. Who did I know? What director did I know that was famous enough and successful enough that if I came to them with a project, they maybe could get it done? Uh, and I thought of Robert immediately. I'd been sitting reading some Agatha Christie murder mysteries, and I said, wait a minute, Robert Altman loves to do something very different every time he works. If you notice it, and you probably yes. know enough about him to know that, he liked to change Amelia every time. It would be Chicago, and it would be... Where did he do the movie about them? the jazz thing with Harry Belafonte? Um, oh, what was that one you, you called? You stumped me. Okay. But he moves about on the He loves to move about. He's uh, in Canada. In he's Nashville and L.A. with a player. And, he's and in Europe. He's with a movie business. He's with people in jail in a small smother, southern town. Cookie's fortune. He's everywhere, basically. And I thought, he's never been in, in period England. That's I mean, right. I don't think he's ever been in England before. I mean, he's been to England, but I don't think he made a movie about it. And I thought... Give him a murder mystery. He sort of had one in the player, but as always with Robert, nothing's ever a genre. So if so, I decided to come to him with this radical idea that he should make a period murder mystery about a bunch of very rich people in the middle of London in a shooting party for the weekend. And I, I didn't dress it up too much. It was pretty much like that. Where was it shot? We shot in Rutten, England, which is probably spelled W-R-O-U-T-H-G-Y-L-P. <laughs> it's like, you never know where Rutten was. You can't look it up because it's not spelled that way. In a beautiful manor house. We didn't do anything to the manor house. Uh, Stephen Altman, who's Robert Altman's son, was the production designer. He's just He did about seven of Bob's movies, and uh, he's a wonderful guy. And uh, basically, we changed some furniture, he altered a few things, but the house that you see in Gosford Park, except for the servants' quarters and anything in the attic, they, t they tore all that out. They no longer have servants' quarters for 42 servants, and oh, they no. lived down there in the kitchen. So we built all that at Shepperton. Oh, I see. Or another studio, I can't actually remember. Uh, and then that house is pretty much as you see it in the movie. And now, of course, one thing Robert Altman is known for is ensemble cast. Yes. Um, another great director who you've worked with, who is famous for that, is Christopher Guest. Oh, I guess so, yeah. Um, you, you've done four films with, with Christopher Guest. Uh, do you have a favorite Christopher Guest film, favorite Christopher Guest moment? My, my favorite moment with Christopher Guest is simply being around him. And it's always pretty much the same. He's really fun to work with. He makes you feel like you could do anything he's not judgmental he doesn't his, you walk into one of these things and it's like you he doesn't say it but it's like you do not have please don't try to be funny be there react bring whatever you want to bring to this thing and it's so exciting he has great judgment he really knows how to get a performance from somebody without almost saying anything he puts the right people together and it's so funny i mean wait, waiting for guffman yeah. you, you are the only one who is, is, is rising above it slightly. You're, you seem to be the only one who knows. He was what, quite <laughs> as stupid as everybody else. No, I wouldn't say they were stupid. 
but my character was very serious. I do tend to be like the serious one in those things because I don't know if I am that serious, but it, it's sort of, we all kind of occupy a consistent space. And I am sort of the one who takes things seriously, I guess. I've heard that there may not be another a Christopher Guest film of that type. The mockumentary yeah. might be going away. Is it, Do you anticipate working with him again? Well, I do anticipate working with him again. We did a little series for HBO a year or two ago. Oh, you may have never heard of it because I don't think too many people saw it, but it was a lot of fun. I can't remember what it was called. Uh, but we had a really good time, and it was the same people that you're mostly used to seeing. Um, I'd love to work with him in anything, and we all love working together, and it's a bunch of people that when I see them, I'm like, oh my God, I'm so happy. And in some cases, I haven't seen some of these people for 20 years. Although most of them I see, because you know, we, we, it was mostly the same cast. It got bigger every time we did a movie, because he adds on the people that he likes. Yes. Well, I, I hope it happens again. I, I love, love yeah. I, I love the Christopher Guest film. Me too. Uh, switching gears a little bit to the, to the uh, early part of your career. I mm -hmm. think the first thing that anybody really saw you in was Midnight Cowboy. Yeah. Uh, but you're better known in your early career for Close Encounters of the third kind. That's not as early, though. The, the, the early, early career was when I was still a senior in college, and that was Midnight Cowboy and Catch-22 were the first things I was able to do. And I think Close Encounters was about 10 years later, actually. And I did some stuff in between. I just don't remember it that well. So, 77, I think, was, was Close, in, close Encounters. Yeah. You were... Uh, uh, 30s or uh, I was around, around 32. okay what what strikes you from close encounters because you met and worked with two great directors on that film of course Steven Spielberg and Francois Truffaut did you also get to know Truffaut fairly well well I was the only person in the movie who spoke French and I didn't speak French that well I don't know I, I wrote a movie a book about the making of the movie called the close encounters diary uh, that became kind of the making of the movie book so I, I've, I've told the story I will tell you before so it's it's not like the first time I ever told it but when I auditioned for the movie I didn't have to audition exactly but I had to meet with Stephen and Julia Roberts and a couple of other people from the movie and they said well really you're gonna be his interpreter so if he says something in French you say it in English and sometimes you may actually have to translate for him and they said so you know do you speak French I said oh yes I'm very very good which I didn't speak <laughs> French very well and so, they, so that got you the part maybe or and 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 Almost. Almost. And then they said, well, talk to us in French. And I said, il y avait beaucoup d'années depuis que j'ai parlé français. Si vous me donnez ce boulot, ce sera très difficile pour moi. Which means, if you, I don't know, I haven't spoken French in many years. And if That's you, more than I speak. And if you give me this job, it will be very difficult for me. And none of, nobody there spoke French, and I got the job. And then immediately I had to start going to Berlitz, cramming and cramming and cramming so I'd be ready. And, and I was. And I stood next to Francois Truffaut for seven months on the set. We got to be pretty good friends. I loved him. He was so much fun to be with, and he was kind of, looked a little impenetrable. He was a little daunting. He was very kind of formal. He wore great clothes. He had all, you know, his shoes were shined. He had a lovely briefcase with him. I'm like, a, you know, I have a kind of a suit on, but I'm kind of, you know, pig pen, basically. <laughs> so it was a little daunting. But as soon as I got to know him, because he didn't like to speak English, it, it embarrassed him. And did, did he know much English at the time? He was studying English all the time. I, sometimes I, I would we would hang out together. We had we double dated with my wife and Terry Gar. Actually, uh, we really had a good time. And and I, I once was at his apartment or with a hotel or wherever we were at. And I said, "Why do you have a tape recorder in the bathroom?" I had just gone to the bathroom, and he said, "Well, I'm always practicing my English." So he would stand there in the morning shaving, going, "Oui, je m'appelle François." Oh, oh no, he would say, "Yes, my name is François," and he didn't feel that his humor. Uh, translated well into English and he was kind of embarrassed about it so he spoke French and I kind of learned to speak pretty good French by the end of the movie and uh, we got to be friends and I have some great anecdotes about him if you uh, if you want to read the Close Encounters diary. I would love to. Okay. Now working with directors of that caliber is no, um, uh, was nothing new to you because you grew up in an entertainment family, your, your family is well known as a theater movie television family can you did you feel pressure to go into the business or is this something that developed as a natural love for acting on your own i would say yes uh, there was no pressure to do anything in particular my family was wonderfully laissez-faire i was not pressured really to do much of anything except i knew from the time i was five years old that i loved making things up i had puppet i, invite, I didn't invite people i forced my family to attend these horrible puppet plays that I would put on. Once in a while I'd ditch the puppets and get in the stage myself and put on a play. I had no idea this would really happen. My mother had been starring in a Broadway show when she was about 21 years old and my dad who lived in Chicago said, 
we can't keep this up. I'm tired of driving to New York all the time. Quit the play, marry me, come be in Chicago. And she did that. So I think in my case, there was literally uh, stuff in my blood that was compelling me to do something. I never thought I would have a career. I was too short. I was too funny looking. Who would ever? Well, how could I be an actor? You know, but then, you know, Dustin Hoffman came along and like opened the door for a lot of us and uh, a short, funny looking Jewish people. And, um, and I ended up having a career, but I did not anticipate that. My uncle Barney and my dad had seven brothers. They started a Nickelodeon in Chicago in 1908. They were poverty stricken. They lived in a slum in Chicago where they had a little failing delicatessen. My grandmother went to the Nickelodeon one day and she said, boys, we're going into the movie business. There's no waste. It's not like lettuce. When it spoils, you don't throw it out. And there's no credit in their store. Everybody was like signing, I'll take this, I'll take that. And then at the end of the month, my grandfather, who was a pushover, couldn't collect the money from the people and they were going downhill. She said, Nickelodeon, you put a nickel in, you see the product, you're done with your movie, you send it back, you've got a fresh one. It's a business model. Well, she didn't use those words. Uh, and they went into the movie business and built the largest chain of uh, theaters in the Midwest, Balaban and Katz. Katz was my uncle at the time. He became my grandfather later on. That's another day. I'll tell you about that if you like. And uh, then... They had a very close relationship with Paramount, and in the early 30s, Adolf Zucker, who started Paramount and created it, asked my uncle Barney to run it, and he eventually owned and operated Paramount for about 35 years, and then Sam Katz, who had been my uncle and then my, who was married to my father's sister, and later on she died, and he married my mother's mother. He ran RKO for a while, he ran Paramount a little bit before my uncle did, other uncle, and then he was head of the musical unit at MGM and produced all the musicals uh, ending with singing in the rain and some other great so this is in your blood this is really in your blood but i only have a couple of relatives who went into any form of show business the rest of them are just you know smart hard-working nice people who do things but uh, we didn't end, most of us didn't end up here one of the things looking over your imdb biography i was shocked at is the number of television credits you have produced directed written starred in so many uh television uh shows and television projects uh the, the one thing i think you're most well known for in television is Seinfeld yeah. and you probably get tired of answering Seinfeld questions you were in five episodes you played the president of NBC yeah. do you have fond memories of that was that fun to do well I really enjoyed it yes uh, it was fun being with the audience uh, I didn't know the show that well the first time I was on it was the end of the first season uh, I think Keith Hernandez had done his famous episode, but other than that, I wasn't that aware of it. I think it was number 89 in popularity, and it was on the wrong night. So at the end of the first season, I was the head of NBC. I played that. I came back the next year, and there was no reaction to it. You, you would, I wouldn't have known I did anything. And then I came back, and they had moved it, what, to Thursday night at 9 o'clock, or whatever it, it, it did, was. It did move early in, in the run. And it went to being number five in one day. Obviously, it was just waiting to be in the right night at the right time, and I think it was in, you know, one, two, three, four, or five, four years, and I did my couple of episodes, and I came back to New York, and it's like I couldn't walk down the street without cars, like, screeching to all the, look, there's the head of NBC. I had people in airports selling me projects. I'm like, no, I'm not really the head of NBC. And then I did an HBO movie called The Late Shift where I actually played Warren Littlefield. At least I had a pretend name, Russell Dalrymple, when I was on NBC for pretend. Well, I have to end on a very serious question. Uh, why do you never age? Uh, you, you look at Close Encounters, and you look maybe 10, 15 years older than you did in Close Encounters. That was almost 40 years ago. So what is your secret? Um, dark lighting. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's pretty, it's like orange and it's dark. You know, we try to go out at night like vampires. Nothing more, uh, more <laughs> insightful than... <laughs> I can't say, you know, I don't know. I. I I, I'm not aware of looking especially anyway of any kind but thank you oh, I will say thank you it must mean I'm a good person but it doesn't really well you're welcome you're welcome and I admire your work thank, thank you, you for speaking with me today and uh, enjoy the Florida Film Festival I hope so. this is Cameron Meyer speaking with mr. Bob Balaban here at the 2015 Florida Film Festival